I'd like to start with some of the early work back at the turn of the 1900s, over 100 years ago, H.L. Fairchild, the New York State geologist, traveled around New York State by horse, buggy, train, canal, Model T, and did field work throughout New York State and came up with a series of about 13 maps drawing an interpretation of the evidence that he found for the glacial advance and retreat in New York State. New York was completely, almost completely covered with ice back during the Pleistocene, the last Wisconsin and glaciation. There were a couple of others before that. We're going to focus mostly on the last ice age and the retreat of the ice for about 30,000 years ago up until about 10,000 years ago. And he drew a series of maps and they were incredibly detailed. This is one stage, the Lake Iroquois stage, in the series of maps that he made. And here you can see Oneida Lake. There was a major proglacial lake, a lake in front of the glacier, and it drained down through what we call the Iro Mohawk, the Iroquois Mohawk River Channel and that created a widening of the Mohawk River Valley, which was also gouged out a little bit by glaciation. We take a look at the next one. Um, a lot of geologists have, have done work on glacial features here in the Northeast. And during the last glaciation, the Wisconsin and all of New York State, except for a little bitty area down here, on the southern border in Allegheny County. This is called the Salamanca Reentrant. And that's the only area in New York State that does not have evidence of glaciation on it. It's also a driftless area out here in Wisconsin. And there appears to have been no ice moving across that area. To give you the idea of the size of the ice sheet here, it completely covered the Adirondack Mountains. Mount Marcy is up over 5,000 feet. So there was almost a mile thickness of ice here, tapering down to the terminus or the end of the ice down in northeastern Pennsylvania. As the ice retreated, it went to the Binghamton stage down here where I grew up and got my master's degree down here in Binghamton, and then retreated in a series of stops and possibly restarts. And again, we don't know if these are Long stand, well, we know this one is a long standing stop, but as we look at the trail of glacial deposits in New York State, are they evidence of readvances? Are they evidences of just still stands? But whatever they were, something was causing the ice to melt and retreat. And when we say retreat, it's melting faster than it's advancing. It doesn't slide back up the valleys as it does coming down. It grinds and scrapes across the surface. Then when it gets to the end, it begins to melt. And when the amount of melting is greater than the advance of the ice, then we have what we refer to as retreat. My, one of my first exposures to it was as an undergraduate at Hamilton in a glacial geology course with Don Potter. And in 1984, my good friend and neighbor asked me to work with her on a field trip for teachers for the New York State Geological Association. And I had seen the Fairchild maps and I wanted to try and update them. So I sat down on the drafting table and hand drew and inked in a series of maps. And this is one of those maps indicating one of the still stands or one of the readvances of the ice, a relatively long one, and it left large moraines across the surface of New York State, and this formed the heads of the Finger Lake Valleys. Finger Lake Valleys were originally streams. As the glaciers moved down across them, it gouged them out and formed deep U-shaped valleys that we know of as the Finger Lakes today. And the moraines that were left by the melting ice sheet blocked off the southern end of those. 
So those streams drain to the north. The Finger Lakes drain northward. Oneida Lake drains northward to Oswego. The St. Lawrence drains northeastward into the Atlantic. The Hudson, that one drains to the south, as does the Susquehanna. And the uh, Genesee starts even farther south of the Valley Heads Moraines and drains up into Lake Ontario. So this is the Valley Head stage, one of those stages of retreats from the ice. And here you can see a number of those from work that was done in the 2000s. And there are a large number of, of folks that have mapped these moraines. And the, the red lines here are some of those moraines. And Jack Ridge and other geologists have uh, done radiocarbon dating on many of these moraines, the piles of till, unsorted, unlayered sediment at the end of the ice. And the valley heads have been dated, and we'll see another image in just a couple minutes. They're dated at about 13.8 thousand years ago, or 13,800 years ago, based on the carbon-14 in organic material found in those piles of sediment. The maximum extent down here was about 30,000 years ago, and it began to retreat back. And by about 11 and 10,000 years ago, it had opened up north of the Adirondacks and north of uh, our area here and was draining out through the St. Lawrence and created some major changes in the drainage. Oops, excuse me. With the advent of new technologies, particularly LIDAR, geologists in the western part of the state and east of here have been doing a lot of detailed work. And Hess and Reiner in 2009 came out with a couple of papers and uh, Hess has been doing a lot of work in the Buffalo and Rochester area and in the Finger Lakes region, identifying drumlins, as you can see here, between Oswego and Rochester. And Fairchild was aware of these. This is one of the largest drumlin fields in the world. There are over 10,000 drumlins between the area north of Oneida Lake, through the Montezuma Swamp, and over toward Rochester. I will talk a little bit about what a drumlin is in a few minutes, but the LIDAR imaging allows us to take a look at that and be able to statistically and numerically analyze the data. Now, what do I mean by LIDAR? Well, the LIDAR images that I've been using come from the New York State GIS Clearinghouse. This is available online, and they have 30 meter LIDAR images of the entire state. You can get a variety of different products from them. You can get the isoline maps, you can get Landsat imagery, and you'll notice, you see the line going right across here, that's the northern boundary of Oneida County. These light, or, uh, Landsat images, which are the visual images, are a mosaic of a large number of satellite images. So we can have the visual view. And underneath that <clears throat> is the LIDAR image at 30 meters. So if you're interested in more about the 30 meter LIDAR, go to the New York State GIS Clearinghouse. Very easy to find online. What parts of New York State have been covered by LIDAR? Central Oneida County is well covered at one to two meters. Madison, Southern Herkimer, parts of Ots Otsego are covered. And more recently, Herkimer County has been covered but the northern part of Oneida County has not. It is in progress as of the 2019 FEMA project. 
They are covering Oneida County, but I have not seen any of the images to this point. What is LIDAR? It's laser ranging. They send a, a laser beam out from an airplane between 1,500 and 3,000 feet above the surface. Airplane or helicopter, you can even use a drone. It sends the beam down and it reflects off various surfaces. And like the radar that they use for checking your speed, there are which it reflects allows you to determine how far away it is. If you look at the graph of how the laser beam reflects back up to the receiver, we can see a number of different returns. The first return would be these red areas at the tops of the trees. The second return, the yellow areas, the third down here in the greens, the fourth, the blues, and the last return is down here on the ground surface. So by taking these series of reflected waves, you can cancel out any one of these sets of returns. And you can take away the trees, you can take away the buildings, you can take away the shrubbery, and just leave the surface, or you can look at just the buildings, the surface and the buildings. You can massage the data in a lot of different ways. The main one that I've been using is looking at the last return, the final return, the ground surface, with all of that yucky vegetation taken off the top. I say that not to offend my fellow scientists that are into biology, but more geology is a lot easier to see when you can get rid of the vegetation. Here we have the New York State LIDAR image at, uh, this is the area, I think these are the one meter, or two meter uh, reflections. The one on the left shows the vegetation. This is what the image looks like with the ground surface and the vegetation. You can't see much up here, can't see much down here, but you sure can pick out the Erie Canal and Route 46 and some roads and streams. Here's Wood Creek winding its way down through here just west of Rome. But if we look on the right, notice with the vegetation layer removed, these are the sand dunes at the Rome sand plains. We have flat depressions here. You can see Wood Creek. Again, you can still see the Erie Canal in Route 46, but notice how it allows you to see the ground surface so much more clearly. When you get these from the New York State Clearinghouse, they come out as, you can download them as digital elevation model tiles. And it's a, a file of the raw data. And you have to download this and then massage it in a management system like ArcGIS. And then you can produce the images. This one on the right shows you each of the individual tiles. And these are the downloadable packages. And then you can mosaic them together to cover a larger area. Here's Route 46. This is the area we were just looking at just south of the Rome Sand Plains. And over here on the right is a set, or a set of two meter images. You may be able to recognize these a little bit better. Here's the canal and the Mohawk River. Excuse me, this is the New York State Thruway right here. Here is Route 12. Just south of this image is the canal and the Mohawk River. For those of you that are familiar with the area, and Rebecca may recognize Sumi Pali right up here in the area over in this area. Right here, here's Route 12 coming up toward Deerfield. This area right here is the former Riverside Mall or Riverside Center. 
Notice the buildings are wiped out. Those reflections have been removed and just the ground surface. But you'll notice these lines on the ground surface. These are the streets up in the neighborhoods up in Deerfield and over here toward Marcy. You can see some of the streets and the roadways. Oops. You can also colorize these images by elevation. The ArcGIS system allows you to get into them and color them. The red areas are the higher elevations. We're looking at elevations around 450 feet, right at the break from the yellow to the red, roughly in the yellow area here, about 450 feet. So the red areas are above 500 feet. And again, this is North Utica. Here's the throughway interchange where the arterial comes across the river and heads up to the north. Here you can see Rome with the Erie Canal, the Mohawk River, the westernmost edge of the Mohawk River that used to come down like this. The bridge going into Rome. And we'll take a look at some of the details on these in a little bit, but I wanted to show you the merged mosaics and the colorization. You can also put scale on them the north arrow, and you can uh, work with the digital data here to obtain a lot of background information. Now, what do we mean when we're talking about the glaciers that are here? The glaciers that were here in Oneida County and neighboring counties covering most of the north, um, northernmost part of, of the northeast, coming down from Canada, traveling across the Adirondacks. These were continental glaciers, very large glaciers, like the glaciers today in Greenland and Antarctica. And I've never had a chance to go to either one of those, but I have had a chance to see the modern analog of some of these areas up in Alaska. And uh, Iceland has some very, very fine bits of evidence of modern analogs, areas that today are similar to what this part of central New York was like in the past. Here's the advancing lobe of the glacier, a big tongue of the glacier. When I talk about the terminus, I'm talking about this area right here, right at the edge of the glacier. There are layers of sediment that get caught, included in the glacier that may be blown in by the wind, washed down by streams. We have active ice that's still moving down in the valleys stagnant ice that has stopped moving, the rate of accretion at the top is less than the amount of ablation at the bottom, or it may just stop moving. And you'll have moulons or streams that will sink into it. Uh, one of the things I found when I, I saw my first glacier up close and personal, I thought you'd see a lot of water running across the top. There's very little most of it is flowing through or under the ice. Beyond the edge of the glacier, there's a lot of sediment that get, gets dumped by it. This is the glacial till that we were talking about um, with Robert at the beginning before we started the program. Glacial till is unsorted, unstratified, unlayered. It's kind of a mixed bag. And if you've ever dug in any of the farm fields around here and many of the backyards, you run into a lot of pebbles and cobbles and even some boulders. That's glacial till. Some of the areas are underlain by glacial lake deposits, pro-glacial lakes where the meltwater got trapped either by moraines or by the rock walls to the south. The water got trapped from a fairly large lake and chunks of the ice would break off and float around in there. We'll talk about some of those proglacial lakes. Colgan, in 2003, one of the investigators in the western part of New York State, did a statistical analysis and did a flow chart and was able to classify a number of the landforms in western New York, and they're just as applicable to here in central New York. The till plains, glacial till, that mixed sediment, either ablation till from melting on the ice or lodgement till plastered to the bottom of the glacier. 
And these are areas that would be analogous or similar to this area in front of the glacier and left just underneath the glacier. Drumlins are streamlined piles of till, generally unstratified and unsorted, not layered. And we'll be looking at some drumlins in just a minute. Stagnation terrain, where the ice is stopped, where blocks of ice get left in the, in the sediment and leave what we call dead ice sinks, which is a large block of ice that melted, or a kettle. Kettle is a small depression in the ice, or a, a depression that's left by a melting ice block, where an ice block is left, sediment fills in around it, and when the ice melts, there's nothing there. A kettle is a pile of sediment from a lake or a deposit or an area along the side of the ice. We can have a, a, a came terrace forming piles of sediment along the sides of the valley that were left as they collected on the side of the ice. An esker is a sinuous ridge formed by sediment, be formed on, in, or under the ice. And then down below the ice, we find outwash, lots of sediment being carried by the meltwater streams and the glacial lake, the proglacial lake that we talked about before, can be trapped by the ice at the north, can be trapped in between two lobes of the ice, east and west, or can be trapped between the ice and the mountains or bedrock to the south of it. In this project, I looked at 10 different areas within Oneida County, here's Oneida Lake, and a little bit of Madison County down here and a little bit over into Herkimer County. Here's the Thruway, here's Utica, Rome. We're gonna look at each of these 10 areas marked in green. We'll start over here on the lower right on the east side over in Herkimer County, where in the 30 meter image, you can see a huge well, good-sized drumlin field, not as large as the one between Oswego and Rochester. And the ice appears to have been moving from east to west. A couple of uh, places I may be mentioning are the Adirondack Highlands, the hard bedrock areas um, of mostly metamorphic rocks. Very, very old, the rocks are a billion years old in some cases. The Erie Ontario lowlands, which are softer shales and evaporites, it got eroded away pretty easily and helped form the Mohawk River Valley and the channel for the Mohawk. And the Appalachian Plateau. I live, <clears throat> excuse me, down here on the Appalachian Plateau. Uh, the elevations here in the lowlands run between 300, 400 feet or so. Up here in the Appalachian Plateau, we're 1,000 feet to 1,500 feet. Up here in the Adirondacks, we go up to as high as 5,000 feet. On the far right-hand side of the study area, over in eastern Herkimer County, near West Edmiston, you can find in the one and two meter LIDAR images, drumlins steeper on the side that the ice was coming from and trailed out getting lower in elevation in the direction the ice is flowing. Another drumlin here, pair of drumlins here, a couple drumlins down here, a little lower in elevation, and flutes, very thin, narrow ridges, straight line caused by the glacier moving over the top of this. There's a couple of different theories of drumlin formation. One is that they were loose sediment that was dragged out by the glacier. Another one, interesting one that I've heard, and I haven't heard a lot about this one, is that they were formed by water melting the underside of the glacier and folding a mold that drops down and 
a mold like a like a spoon or a jello mold that left these long sinuous things. I find that an interesting idea, but tend to be a traditionalist and think that they're probably formed by the streaming out of loose sediment as the glacier moved over the top. Now this drumlin, you'll notice on the scale down here, this thing is less than a mile long. It's not very big, it's probably 30 to 50 feet in elevation. In the western part of New York, there are some that are 100, 150 feet high and a mile or two miles long. With ArcGIS, with the manipulation of the digital elevation models, you can form a, a 3D image and rotate it to take a look at the shape. And this is that same drumlin we were just looking at a minute ago. And you can see the direction of ice movement from the right to the left. Now this we believe is from the Hudson Mohawk lobe of the glacial ice still moving around the Adirondacks and pushing upstream up the Mohawk River Valley. Now, what does a glacier look like, look like at the terminus? We saw a drawing of it, but this is the end of the Mendenhall Glacier, uh, just north of Juneau, Alaska, or just, yeah, just north of Juneau, Alaska. There's not a lot of till, there's not a lot of sediment being carried by it, but you can see some of those boulders and cobbles in the glacial till. When I was there in 1993, this had just been exposed. When I was there in 2010, this ice terminus was about three quarters of a mile, of a mile upstream from where it was in this image. One of the things I was amazed when I walked up to the first glacier, the Mendenhall here, first one I ever came in close contact with, is like standing in front of a refrigerator in the summertime with the door open, or the freezer with the door open. You could feel the cold air rolling down off the glacier into your face, and it does make you kind of chilly. You stand with the ice behind you. This is at the Ptarmigan Glacier, uh, right adjacent to the area where the uh, Mendenhall begins. And here you can see the moraine, the lumpy, bumpy topography, little spots where there may have been chunks of ice that melted out, causing depressions, the glacial till, the glacial erratics, the great big rocks that are dragged down. These are pretty strong evidence of glaciation. And the ice in this case would have been moving from left to right. There was an active glacier here in 1993, just a little bit farther up, and you can see some of the winter snow that stayed there, and this was in August. So this will probably be there all that whole summer and into the next winter. The meltwater coming down through here was just frigid, extremely cold. And when we stayed at Camp 17A further down the valley, we had to wash up in the morning with the water out of the creek. It was pretty cold. Another view of the dates of the Moraines, just like those piles of sediment we were just looking at, here's the Valley Heads Moraines at about 13.8 thousand years, or 13,800 years ago. About 12,000 years ago, the Rome lobe of the Ontario lobe, the Rome extension of the Ontario lobe, had pushed down into the upper Mohawk Valley just east of the area where Rome is today. And at about that same time, the ice was moving back up the Hudson River Valley. Water, meltwater was draining out through the Hudson. And here when the Rome lobe was here, it blocked off some of the drainage. And the main drainage was out through the Mohawk down into the Hudson and then out and formed a huge delta out here in the Atlantic Ocean. Back to Alaska, looking at Glacier Bay, we have a pretty large glacier up here, uh, the Grand Glacier up near Marjorie Glacier at the head of Glacier Bay. And here we have piles of till, the glacial moraine, and a lateral moraine along the edge of this glacier here. 
And this is what the area just north of Utica may have kind of looked like back about 12,000 years ago. We go a little bit south of the Utica area down toward Oriskany Falls, OF right here. We can see the Valley Heads Moraines, those moraines that I showed in one of the diagrams earlier. And this was the terminus of the glacier, the recessional moraine as the glacier was retreating. Oriskany Falls is right here. Skyline Drive goes up here. Route 12B goes this way. You can see the railroad bed right here, excuse me, and traces of the old Shenango Canal wandering along, headed down toward Madison. And this lumpy topography here is that same glacial till like we were looking at at the end of the Ptarmigan Glacier. Here's the Kaku Glacier in 2010. Here are some of the meltwater channels coming out of the Taku, going down and forming and flowing into the Taku River. Huge amounts of meltwater. Moraines being formed right here at the short terminus. And at the time I was there in 93, the Taku was still advancing was probably out in this area out here. And in the 17 years between when I did the research there and I went back up on a cruise, the ice had melted back and had stopped advancing and was receding. Here we have the area of the ice margin, very similar to what we were seeing in the Taku Glacier right there. The ice would have been a little farther, well, down in the area here, and then retreating a little farther north and the meltwater channels pouring down through here. Madison Lake is a dead ice sink where a large block, several blocks of ice were left. The sediment filled in around them and then the ice block melted. There's a little kettle right in front of the Madison School. Here's Route 20 right here. And if you take a look at this little kettle, this time of year, you'll find the, the children sledding from right off the front of the school down into this little kettle. We have canes or pile of sediments. And up here, just before you reach, right here is Salisville, right along the Oriskany Creek in here, there's an ester pile of sediment left on, in, or under the ice. And this is an ice marginal feature. This would have formed very, very close and probably right at the edge of the ice margin. And what does it look like under the glacier? I was surprised to see underneath the Mendenhall, I crawled down and oh, it's about 18 inches from top to bottom here, or about a meter and a half, or excuse me, about a half a meter, about a half a meter or foot and a half. Pebbles, cobbles, behind me there would be some boulders. Here's the bedrock that's ground and scratched and grooved by the ice and the ice grinding on this makes this material very much like sandpaper. It just grinds across the surface of the ice and leaves rock flour, which turns the meltwater streams kind of a chalky white or gray. But notice the shape. Remember I talked about those flutes. You can almost imagine those on a larger scale being left by the ice as it slid over the surface. Romans maybe being formed by a larger structure like this as the ice was moving toward us, grinding across this sediment on a much, much larger scale. We looked at this image earlier. I was talking about these curvy things up here, but right in here, just south of Wood Creek, along Route 46, south of Rome, north of the Erie Canal, what are these things? 
a little study tells us that they may be crevasse fillings. I got kind of up close and personal with a crevasse while I was working up in Alaska in 93, roped up and climbed down inside them. And what does it look like inside a crevasse? Well, over here on the left, a glacier from SUNY Oneonta is rappelling down into a crevasse. I had the opportunity to do this and you can see the layers of ice with the most recent snowfall at the top, the fern or granular ice, or if you're a skier, a spring snow, and then underneath becoming more and more compacted until it turns to very, very coarse, grainy ice underneath, and then solid ice even farther down into the crevasse. If sediment flows along and deposits inside of these crevasses, they'll form very, very fine layers. And this is a crevasse filling in Pratt's Hollow, a little bit north of Morrisville, over in Madison County, with a young Dr. Tewksbury for scale. If we look at the Norris Glacier, a currently active glacier up on the Juneau Ice Field, here are those crevasse patterns. Yellow arrows indicate the crevasses stretching from right to left. And then as the ice flows, and as the ice goes over a, a rock fall, like a waterfall, a glacier is like a river of ice, but moves very, very slowly. Think of silly putty. In long-term stress, it flows. Under short-term or more rapid stress, it breaks. It'll crack and snap. And that's what forms some of these crevasses. And here we can see crevasses going parallel to the direction of ice flow, parallel to the medial moraines. And here we can see them going perpendicular to the medial moraines. You can also see a small glacial lake eventually forming a, a came terrace along the side of the Norris Glacier right here. These are those crevasse fillings, and they show up incredibly well in the LIDAR, and some of them going more parallel to the direction of ice flow, and some of them going more perpendicular to the direction of ice flow. And then here's Wood Creek, meandering its way through glacial lake deposits and soft sediments, soft sedimentary rocks, and here's the canal, and here's Route 46. This is the old Erie Canal, not the current Erie Canal. And these are fairly short. They're tenth of a mile, two tenths of a mile, maybe a half a mile long, some of them. What does it look like underneath the ice? Well, we had a chance when we were up in the ice field to look in an ice cave, to climb in an ice cave. And that solid blue old ice over here, the sunlight coming through, is the red light is filtered out and only the blue comes through. Water poured down through here, carved out this cave, snow blew in, dirt blew in on top of the snow. And this is right at the entrance of the cave. This is up on the Lemon Creek Glacier on the Juneau Ice Field. And if you turn around and move farther down the channel that the lake or that the stream caused underneath the ice, here's Glacial Till. This is a lateral moraine along the side. There's sediment forming here in the bottom. This may end up being a little cane terrace or even if there's enough sediment, it may leave an esker. Here's the roof of the ice and water drips down forming almost stalactites of ice, icicles from the ceiling and the material piles up on the floor and it's ice, not calcite like you'd find in a, in a cave around here. And here's a surface where the ice was and then the water drained out. So the water level was higher at one time inside of this cave and at one time it probably filled the whole thing up and he wrote it out this cavern. 
Here's a view of an esker, an aerial view. Here's the terminal moraine. The ice would have been in this area right here. Here's a schematic drawing. Here's the ice, ground moraine underneath it, the ester going through here and then flowing out and might form a delta or might be breached eventually. And here's the end or recessional moraine where the ice had stopped. Here's an esker, uh, the Whitestown esker. It is just north of the thruway. Um, here is the Judd Road extension, Route 233 over here. And I remember going out here with Dr. Potter as an undergraduate. And he said, one of the things to look for for glacial deposits, look for cemeteries and pig farms. They are well drained. They are uh, porous soil. And there is a rather major pig farm right out here, or there was back in the 80s and 90s, um, right along the Whitestown Esker. So we do have eskers. Robert was asking about where do we find eskers. And if you look at the topographic maps or look at the LIDAR images, you can find these things relatively easily. And they indicate very near the ice margin. So where are the ice margins? Right here, we have the Mohawk lobe coming in from the east, the Ontario lobe from the west, got our Adirondack lobe coming down from the north. But in the late stages of glaciation, meltwater got trapped between these two lobes and formed shorelines. Right here to the south, we have the Appalachian Plateau, which formed the southern margin drainage outlet at Bouckville near Madison, where we were looking at the LIDAR images down here near the ice margin, and also another outlet at Cedarville. And this is Glacial Lake Cedarville uh, from information from the North American Glacial Varve Project. Here's an ice marginal lake at the Mendenhall Glacier, sediment being deposited. Here's the shoreline. Here's a little collapse feature where the ice broke off. And notice no water flowing on it, most of the water in the discharge is underneath at the base of the glacier. Here's an ice cave at the base of the Mendenhall. Growlers floating around and imagine this is what the Mohawk Valley would have looked like at the time of Glacial Lake Albany at probably somewhere around 12,000 years ago. The ice just north of Riverside Center icebergs and growlers breaking off, sediment being deposited. And today the, the bottom of the Utica Marsh is this fine grained flat lacustrian sediment that was left by the glacial lakes and left by uh, the drainage from glacial Lake Iroquois. Then you would have seen chunks of ice, the glacier to the north, pieces breaking off and calving and, and falling in like the Marjorie Glacier up in Glacier Bay, Alaska. And here we see those growlers that are left. And these would be floating around carrying drop stones. Uh, you'd find Canada geese flying into these, these lakes um, on their migrations northward. And here's the sediment that the glacier was carrying. Here's a little cave where you might find an esker or a meltwater channel. And this is what the area would have looked like in the Mohawk Valley in those late stages, the Laurentide Ice Sheet, about the time that some of those drumlins were being formed to the east. And the shorelines right here at Glacial Lake Amsterdam. Again, there's another esker right up there. And I don't know if Rebecca may have noticed that. We'll take a little closer look at that in just a second. You can see the darker brown coloring here. This is where meltwater is washing up, rising up into the actually salt water of Glacier Bay 
but we didn't have salt water around here, but the processes are, are quite similar. And you can see the brownish, less dense fresh water rising up here at the end of the glacier. So the ice margin would have been up here. The meltwater would have been coming down here. Again, here's the interchange, through interchange at Utica, the canal. Riverside Center, SUNY IT, and right off the parking lot, just to the south of the uh, southern parking lot at SUNY IT, there is an esker indicating that yes, this was the active ice margin. Zoom in a little bit more and you can see the detail. Over here, there's varved clays, the slope, uh, right here is Riverside Center. BJ's would be right about here. And in this parking lot, when this was dug back in the 70s, you could see the sand from the beaches as the lake drained out. In fact, if you still go up, climb up the hill slope to the north of the Riverside Center, there's sand up here. The four-wheelers love driving up here. And this whole slope, now that it's been vegetated for quite a few years, it's a little harder to see, but you can dig into there and get under it and it's varved clays, annual layers of glacial lake clays. As we ice was retreating in the Ontario lobe, it stopped at the edge of the Appalachian Plateau. Here's the Appalachian Plateau, the highlands of about a thousand feet, Erie, Ontario lowlands here. And on the 30 meter image, you can see a rough area right here and it shows the direction of meltwater flow from the Oneida Creek Valley, which was dammed up at the time, drained out across the top of this and drained into the Scanadoa Creek Valley. Closer view with the two meter LIDAR image, you can see that drainage channel that's been carved through the rocks on the top of this peak, this is about 11 or 1200 feet down here in the valley, it's at about 400, tapering down to about 300 feet as you get up toward Oneida Lake. So the ice margin formed the northern edge of this meltwater channel. It drained out, took a 90 degree turn when it hit the ice margin, drained back down the channel and deposited a delta on the Shenandoah Creek Valley. The town of Vernon has a quarry in here and they take out much of the sand that they put on the roads and it's got a lot of uh, red material from the Vernon Shale. And that's why a lot of the roads to the uh, west of us have a very brownish tint to them when they cover them, cover them with sand. There was also a glacial, uh, proglacial lake in the Scandal Creek Valley. Here's Route 26, south of Vernon Center. And right there's the glacial lake floor uh, Simmons Farm is right in this area right here. And this is Marble Hill Road heading up uh, towards Cheryl. We put those two mosaics together. It was a little hard to do because they're two different sets of data. But the ice, the water flowed around this way, hit the ice margin here. And once the ice melted, it just drained out to the north but the water drained out this way into the lake and then farther along the ice margin then out through the Euro Mohawk eventually. And here's another view at the 30 meter that you can see pretty clearly the meltwater channel where the ice margin had stopped for a while and blocked the flow downhill and the ice water was forced over this way forming a very, very large delta. And these deltas, these came deltas, these are great places for looking for um, rounded cobbles and, and boulders and glacial material or uh, those stone walls we talked about before. Appalachian Plateau, you can see a change, a little lumpy, bumpy stuff up here, a little smoother here. The Mohawk River coming down here. This area at Rome is a very interesting area. If you look at the topographic map at about 340 feet, Elevation of, excuse me, about, yeah, about 340 feet. 
This is the shoreline of glacial Lake Iroquois. The lake bottom is underlain by clay, then silt, and maybe marl, a kind of freshwater limestone. And on top of that, swampy material that was left at the base of the lake called peat or the mucklands. And this indicates this was the eastern end of glacial Lake Iroquois. Looking at it in the LIDAR image, you can see a lot more detail. Notice how well Fort Stanwix shows up in the LIDAR image. Mohawk River coming down through here. The highest section in this part of the Erie Canal is right about over here. And the drainage goes to the east from that point, from the lock just to the west of this, it drains westward. Native Americans have a story that this was the high point of the back of Turtle Island, which is in their creation uh, tale of how the earth got formed. A turtle had mud piled up on its back and they knew that the surface was curved and the water flowed away from these two points. Again, the glacial lake shorelines. Here'd be the shoreline that you're standing at. Here's the glacial lake. The water was draining out and um, Mendenhall Lake drains out to the south, out through an outlet, very much like that one we just looked at at Rome. Here's the outlet, glacial lake Iroquois as the ice got almost up to the edge of the Adirondacks. And then once this broke through, and the ice, the water started flowing down through the St. Lawrence, and this was left a little higher and no more water came draining in from the Great Lakes, and only the water that was coming down off the Adirondacks flowed through the Mohawk. But as those lakes drained out, as those glacial lakes drained out, they left shorelines or strand lines, and these are strand lines of glacial lake Iroquois, just uh, northeast of Canastota. And after those lakes drained out, the wind caught the sand along those beach deposits and those shoreline deposits, blew them into parabolic dunes. And that's what we see today as the Rome sand plains. And you can see those parabolic dunes indicating the wind direction from the northwest, very much like the current prevailing wind direction is today. To summarize a little bit, we've looked at areas under the ice, at the end of the ice, the moraines, where the ice margin retreated back in the moraines and the outwash, and then the ice margin and the meltwater channels, and then farther up to the espers, and those features that were formed as the ice continued its northern retreat, and then finally, the outlet at Rome, the strand lines of the lake here, and then those drumlins that are left in the Rome sand plain, or excuse me, not drumlins, but the, the sand dunes that are left here from the drumlins under the ice to the final retreat and the blowing sand and the sand dunes up at Rome sand plains. I'd like to acknowledge a couple of people, again, thanks to Barb Tewksbury and her husband, Dave, um, they gave me an awful lot of guidance, an awful lot of help, and shared a lot of knowledge in LIDAR and GIS. And again, as Robert mentioned earlier, Dr. Don Potter, um, very close friend and mentor, I miss him much. Uh, Jay Fleischer from SUNY Oneana, the Juno Icefield Research Project, National Park Service at, at uh, the um, Glacier Bay National Park. Uh, traveling with the Holland America Cruise Line and, and opportunities to get the photos that I used in this presentation and a number of references. If anybody needs detailed information on these, please feel free to drop me a, a line. You can get a hold of me through the Oneida County History Center. And I'd like to thank Rebecca for having me and open it up for any questions she might have. <laughs>